There's a warfare ongoing today. It's a warfare for your soul, for your life. God wants you to be victorious. However, there are divine principles in order to be victorious. So you see, victory is promised by God. But there are conditions to those promises. And you've got to know your part and do your part. Victorious living, you will discover, is something that you need to maintain day by day, 24-7. In the Bible, you have two occasions where Joshua failed, where Joshua made mistakes. Do you recall the mistake of Joshua? Overconfidence, he did not pray, he did not ask God, and then one of the men was stealing something from God, remember? What is the lesson for us? Sin is the kryptonite of believers. If you allow sin in your lives, in your midst, there's no way you can stand before the enemies. God is saying you will be defeated. The first thing you should do if you have a problem, if I were, if I were you, I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to say, Lord, is there something in my life is there something my wife is doing? Is there something that you want us to learn? Humble yourself. Don't blame others. Just look at yourself. Today, we look at the second failure of Joshua. The Bible tells us he was deceived. Many times, you and I have problems simply because other people did something against us. In this case, it was not the sin of Joshua. It was not the sin of the people. It was deception. Now, the reality is this. You and I are in a spiritual warfare. There are enemies used by Satan to make you trip, to make you fall. It's called deception. How many of you have been deceived at least once in your life? Higher, higher. Do you realize most of us have been deceived? So today, I want to share with you a very important message. Do not be deceived. Turn to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor, do not be deceived. Be on guard. One more time. Do not be deceived. Be on guard. How are we deceived? You know, the Bible is very clear. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Let's read this together. Everybody, be off sober spirit. Be on the alert. Notice the word sober and be on the alert, meaning, hey guys, wake up. Be watchful. Why? Your adversary, meaning there's an enemy, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Look at the graphic picture. It's like a roaring lion. You know why lion roars? It is to tell everybody, I am the king of this property. But then when the lion is about to attack, the lion does not roar. It's quiet. It will slowly follow the prey. What else do you notice? The lion will, use, will usually attack when the prey is not knowledgeable of his attack. He will look after the weakest. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a warfare ongoing today. It's a warfare for your soul, for your life. And many Christians are totally ignorant. You're not aware of the warfare that's ongoing. That's why I love the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua is a lesson for us that God wants you to be victorious. However, there are divine principles in order to be victorious. So you see, victory is promised by God, but there are conditions to those promises, and you've got to know your part and do your part. So, what have we learned? Remember, Joshua chapter 1 gives you the foundation. The Bible says, let this book of the law be in your mouth, meditate on it day and night, study the Bible so that you'll be careful to obey. And then when you obey everything written in it, the promise is what? You will be successful and you will prosper. That is 
the foundation of Christian victory. So tell your neighbor one more time, be on guard. Okay, be on guard. Do not be deceived. So what should you guard? I suggest you guard, number one, your mind. You have to check out what is going on in your mind. Everybody say the word, check it out. Why is that important? Because the battle is in the mind, what you believe. So you got to check it out. What are you listening to? What are you believing? Check it out. One more time. Check it out. Number two, what must you do? You must consult. In the story we just read, what did you notice? They did not consult God. But after consulting God, what must you do? You must commit. Commit to follow God's way. So let's talk about the first principle. Check it out. You know, if you look at Joshua, now because you have read the Bible already, I don't plan to read everything, but I just want to highlight a few things, all right? I want you to see the map. The map tells us the following. Joshua and company, they crossed the Jordan River and they stayed in Gilgal. So Gilgal is the headquarter. So the first city they have to attack is what? Jericho. Remember? That's the first city. The next one is Ai. Ai is around 15 miles, 20 miles. After Ai, the next one is Gibeon. However, the Gibeonites deceived Joshua. They sent a delegation to Gilgal. And they make up an amazing story. Do you know how they deceived Joshua? They were saying, look at our clothes, look at our uh, bread. It's all old stuff. We come from a far away country. No, but I want to give you advanced information. So, because Gibeon was able to deceive Joshua at Gilgal, Joshua and company made a vow. Remember what is the vow? Okay, let's look at the Bible. Okay. When the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, their neighbor, they acted craftily. Guys, check it out. When you hear stories like what they're telling Joshua, they set out as envoys, took worn out sacks on their donkeys, wine skins, worn out, torn, mended, worn out, pat sandals on their feet, worn out clothes on themselves. All the bread of the provision was dry and had become crumbled. In other words, what you see is not really true. But that's how they deceive. How will people deceive you? People don't deceive you blatantly. They deceive you by sounding something true, but not so true. Am I correct? That is the technique of the devil. Now, continue reading. Let's look at Joshua chapter 9. Continue. Verse 7. They went to Joshua the camp at Gilgal, their headquarter, and said to the men of Israel, we have come from a far country, blah, 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 blah. Make a long story short. We are your servants. Joshua said to them, who are you? And where do you come from? You know, the men of Israel were suspicious. You know why? They said, the men of Israel said to the Hevites, perhaps you are living within our land. How shall we make a covenant? You see, because God told them, you cannot make a covenant with the people. They think, hmm, maybe these guys are not telling the truth. Let's read the next few verses. They said to him, your servants have come from a faraway country, but we heard the fame of the Lord your God. Do you recall? They are sounding like Rahab. Remember Rahab? They have said, we heard about God. And Rahab was willing to change her religion. It's now similar to these people. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions. Everybody read aloud. Did not ask for the counsel of the Lord. And that, my friend, 
is our usual problem. We don't ask counsel for the Lord. They made peace with them and made a covenant with them and let them live. And the leaders of the congregation swore an oath. Now, let me share with you the style of the enemy, just like this one, so that you will understand why you should be on guard. Okay, everybody, if you want to remember one point, it's simply this. Today, do not be deceived, be on guard. Can you repeat? Do not be deceived, be on guard. How do you guard yourself? Can I share with you amazing verses from the Bible that I want to encourage you with? In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible, through Peter, warned the believers. Everybody read. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, everybody, be on your guard. So that you will not be carried away by the error of unprincipled men and fall from your own steadfastness. The context has to do with the second coming of Jesus. It has to do with being prepared to meet Jesus. And Peter is telling the believers, be on guard. Friends, be on guard. The apostle Paul told these disciples in the book of Acts. Let's read this together. Together, aloud. Be on guard for yourselves and for the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I want to apply this to all fathers. Fathers, be on guard. Start with yourself as the leader. But then be on guard for your flock, for your family, for your children. Many, many parents, many fathers do not understand their responsibility is not just to guard. Many pastors fail to guard themselves and then they fail to guard their own family. You can be so busy guarding others that you forget to guard yourself. Do not be deceived that you are spiritually so strong that you can handle all kinds of temptation. No, no, no. Be on guard. Do not be deceived. Be on guard. This is warfare. Now, where is the battle? Where's the battle? I don't see warfare. Ah. I want to show you where's the battle. It's in the mind. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. See? Not of the flesh. This is spiritual warfare. Continue. Divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Now, fortresses. What enters your mind when you see the word fortress? In the olden days, fortress are like castle. They are military headquarters, very hard to attack. They become so strong. Satan is building fortresses in your mind. That's the context of this verse. Divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses which Satan has built in your mind. Why do I say that? We are destroying, the Apostle Paul is saying, we are destroying speculations. Again, guard your mind, guard what you are thinking, and every lofty thing raise up against the knowledge of God. Everybody read. We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So the battle has to do in the mind. What you believe, what you think, that is the main battle. But many of us have no idea that what's going on in your mind is the crucial battle ongoing right now. As you are listening to me, I will not be surprised if there are voices entering your head. And these voices, depending on what kind of voice, many times, if it's against God, it's from who? Listen to me, Satan does not appear in front of you. Satan appears to us, the Bible tells us, like the angel. He whispers, he puts thoughts in your mind. You see, if Satan were to appear and tell you what to do, you will not do it. Ooh, you, what will you do? You run away. Now, I do not know your weaknesses, but let me share with you examples of lies of Satan, okay? For example, everyone is doing it. 
I share this in IDC. It must be okay. Everyone is doing it. Anong sabi ng Bible? Be holy. I'm holy. You see, who do you follow? Who do you believe? Satan, whatever makes you happy. It's okay. God wants you to be happy. Use happy toothpaste. No, 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 no. This is the one. Deny yourself and follow me. In other words, to be happy is counterintuitive. Deny yourself and you will find life. Satan says, no, no, no. Satan says, whatever makes you happy, you only live once. Remember this? YOLO. Oh, you only live once. There's life after death, my friend. Follow your heart. Oh, my goodness. This is the favorite. Follow your heart. My friend, the Bible tells us the heart is deceitful. How come there are so many divorces? Why? That's precisely the problem. They follow their heart, and their heart deceived them. Friend, tayo tayo lang, huh? Do you think God loves you? Louder. Yes. If He loves you, is He after your interest? What do you think? Is God after your interest? If God loves me and he's after my interest and God knows what is best, don't you think to follow him is the most logical thing you and I can do? Ah, Satan is a liar. Satan says, God does not love you. Satan will tell you, no, no, no. You do it your way. Your way is happy. God's way is unhappy. Why do you think people commit suicide left and right? Why do you think famous actresses, famous movie stars, they're happy now, then after a while they divorce? Why? Because reality sets in. God knows reality. So, this is a famous one. Premarital sex and living in is okay. Everybody's doing it. Lahat naman gumagawa ng ganyan eh. My friend, God is saying immorality is wrong. So my question to you is simply this. How do you protect yourself? How do you guard yourself? Who will you believe? Will you believe media? Will you believe society? Will you believe your teacher? Or will you believe the Bible? Eventually, it's a choice. Yes or no? I cannot force you to believe anything. You've got to make a choice. In my case, I've decided I will follow the Word of God. I will follow Jesus. Number two, what must you do? Consult. Consult God. Can I teach you how to pray? Oh, you mga single, huh? If you want to marry the right person, will I teach you an amazing attitude of prayer? George Mueller shared this, okay? I seek at the beginning to get my heart into such a state that it has no will of its own in regard to a given matter. Nine-tenths of the difficulties are overcome when our hearts are ready to do the Lord's will, whatever it may be. In other words, when people come to me to help me make decisions, or they ask for advice, even in CCF, when we pray to God, we do our best to be neutral in our heart. Because if you pray with this idea, Lord, ito ang gusto ko. Lord, this guy I want to marry. Is this your will? Yes, yes thank you. No, no. If you want to pray, you must say, Lord, I open my heart. In fact, I tell all my children, do not give your heart to anybody until you are sure this is of God. Because once you give your heart, it's really painful to say no. So that's my advice. When you pray, come before God. Lord, should I go abroad? Should I stay? Should I quit my job? Should I not quit my job? You pray to God objectively. Lord, whatever you tell me, that I'm willing to do. Then I give people advice. How do you know it is God's will? Will it bring God the greatest honor? Or will it dishonor God's name? Are you bothered by the fact that God tells Joshua to kill everybody? Children, women, everybody? Does it bother you, yes or no? How do you resolve that? That's why I want to teach you theology. This is the elephant in the room. When you study the book of Joshua, 
many, not many, is willing to discuss that theology. What, what happened? Why will you kill everybody? All right, quickly. For you to understand why, you need to know the heart of God. Example, for you to process things, to pray very well, there are a few things I want you to know about God, okay? In fact, five of them. Number one, I'd like you to know, number one, that God is sovereign. Yes or no? You got to know theology. God owns everything. He has the right to do whatever he wants to do because God is sovereign, absolute power. Number two, God is holy. God will not do anything that is sinful. Number three, not only is he holy, he is good. God is absolutely good. He is perfectly good. God cannot improve to become gooder. No, no. God is good, period. Why? He's perfect. He doesn't need to improve. He's perfect, perfectly good. And God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows what's best. And then, God is love. He wants what's best for you. Now, once you understand this theology about who God is, you now interpret everything based on the lenses of Scripture. Okay? When God does something, God will not violate one, two, three, four, five. R.C. Sproul said the following. God's, everybody read. God's grace is not infinite. God is infinite. And God is gracious. We experience the grace of an infinite God, but grace is not infinite. God sets limits to his patience and forbearance. He warns us over and over again that someday the ax will fall and his judgment will be poured out. So my friend, I'm just telling you, God is holy. He is infinite, but his grace, his patience is not infinite. You cannot keep on sinning and sinning and expect to get away with murder. Look at the next quotation, which I hope will help you. Without holiness, everybody read, without holiness, God's patience would be indulgence to sin. His mercy, fondness. His wrath, madness. His power, a tyranny. His wisdom, an unworthy subtlety. Holiness gives decorum to them all. You see, God is holy. Therefore, there will be judgment. Now, to share with you why God commanded Joshua to kill everybody in the promised land, if you don't mind, will you please read Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4, together. Do not say in your heart, when the Lord your God has driven out the Canaanites, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me to possess the land. It is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is dispossessing them before you. The Canaanites have reached a point where God is saying, enough is enough. Look at the next verse. It is not your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you are going to enter the promised land. But it is because of the wickedness of the nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you in order to confirm the oath which he swore to your fathers. Now, how wicked were the Canaanites? Let me give you an example from a historical perspective. Leviticus chapter 18. Everybody read the sinfulness of the place. Sounds like today. You shall not have intercourse with your neighbor's wife. That's adultery. To be defiled with her. You shall not give any of your offspring to offer them in Molech. Child sacrifice. You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. That's called what? Homosexuality. It is an abomination. Also, you shall not have intercourse with any animal. According to God, you are going to be defiled. Nor shall any woman stand before an animal to mate with it. It is perversion. 
You want to know what's happening to people? Perverted. Read the next verse. Leviticus. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. <clears throat> when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. So he gives example of sins. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire or who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, one who interprets omens, sorcerer, one who casts a spell, a medium, a spirit, or one who calls up the dead. In other words, the place was so sinful, it's like cancer. You know, when doctor tells you you have cancer and I, I need to cut your arm, is the doctor being ugly, is the doctor being bad, or is the doctor being loving? See, it depends on your perspective. You see, friends, it's so important you have a proper picture of God's holiness and God's desire. Sometimes a place is so sinful that God is saying it's beyond hope. I'm going to judge it. Now, people ask me, what about children? What about children? Can I tell you God's perspective on death? God's perspective on death is different from you and from me. The Bible tells us God does not like the death of the wicked. Okay? The Bible is very clear. You want to see that verse about the death of the wicked? If you look at Ezekiel 17, 32, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies. Therefore, repent. However, God, in another passage, in Psalm 116, says the following. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. How can that be? If you ask my opinion, children, when they die, I believe, I do not up to what age they go to heaven. Because they do not know what's right or wrong. But children, if they're allowed to live in an evil environment, will grow up learning all the foolish things of this world, and they'll commit sin. And God is saying many times it is better to save the children from future sin. Why? Precious in the sight of God is the death of his people. Can I tell you why? Because for God, death is never final. For God, death is to be with him. So your concept of theology is very important. If not, you will have a problem. You will believe the lies of Satan. And then your attitude toward God will no longer be happy. You become angry at God, all right? So as we close, I'd like you to see what happened to the Gibeonites. You know what happened to the Gibeonites? God allowed them to live, yes or no? Yes or no? But do you know, because God allowed them to live, Many of them got converted. I call that the grace of God. What do I mean converted? Look at Chronicles. In the book of Chronicles, the Bible described to us the Gibeonite. Okay? Let's read that together. <clears throat> first Chronicles chapter 9, verse 2. Now, the first who lived in their possessions in their cities were Israel the priest the Levites, and the temple servants. Who are the temple servants? They are called Nathanim. Who are the Nathanim? These are the Gibeonites. What's my proof? I will share with you. Look at Nehemiah, chapter 3, verse 7. In the restoration of the temple, next to Malathiah, the Gibeonite, in Jadon, blah, the men of Gibeon Mitzpah made repairs. In other words, in God's mercy and grace, the Gibeonites became worshippers of God. Even though they were consigned to become servants of the temple, for the rest of their lives, they are servants of the temple they serve. But you notice, even hundreds of years later, many of them continued serving. They would rather go back to Jerusalem than stay in Babylon, because God is merciful. Amen? So, how do you know God was happy 
with what they did because they told the Gibeonites, okay, this one you can read on your own, we cannot kill them because we made a promise to God. You see, they did not violate. They did not violate their vows to God. Do you know what God is telling us today? When you make a promise to God, you must do it. Look at Psalm. The book of Psalm tells us about the importance of keeping your word, okay? In the book of Psalm, everybody read, Oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may stay with you? Who may dwell on your holy hill? He swears to his own hurt and does not change. When you make a commitment, you have to do it. Look at Ecclesiastes. Look at what the Bible says. When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it. He takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. Better you should not vow than you should vow. In other words, they made a vow before God. We will spare you. We will not kill you. Did you know the blessing? Joshua was able to conquer the land faster. Instead of fighting the five kings one at a time, God brought all the five kings together to fight Joshua. And what did God do? God sent hailstones. Did you see that in the Bible? In Joshua chapter 10, the Bible tells us, it's amazing. God said, do not be afraid of them. I'll give all of them into your hand. All of these five kings, they will be, your, they will be yours. The Lord threw them into confusion. They fled before Israel. Notice, the Lord heard large hailstones down on them. More of them died from the hailstone than were killed. In other words, God supported the decision of Joshua. Let me repeat. The book of Joshua is descriptive, not prescriptive. Don't learn from the Gibeonites. I will lie. Okay, okay pala mag-lying dito eh. No, no. The Gibeonites wanted the mercies of God. And God honored them. At the same time, God honored the mistake of Joshua because they admitted their mistake. Joshua said, we made a mistake. We should not have made a vow, but we made a vow. Therefore, let us surrender that vow to the Lord. And you know, historically speaking, amazing. Did you hear, did you read the book of Joshua? How he prayed? Sun, stand still. Moon, stand still. The Bible tells us there was never a day like that. Nasa Bible ba yan? Oh, nasa Bible yan. Look. The Lord delivered up the Amorites before them. And then Joshua prayed, Sun, stand still at Gibeon. And the sun stood still. There was no day like that before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man. Of course, there are many theories, okay? There was a big meteor who went by, who reflected the sunlight, and it was like day for a long time. It doesn't matter. The whole point is this. God is able. Amen? So, in closing, I love Romans 8, 28. Can you read that together? God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called, including your mistake. What's the lesson today? Do not be deceived. Be on guard. Check what you are hearing. When people say this, when people say that, you consult the Bible, consult God. Is what you're hearing biblical or not? And then you must be willing to commit, to follow, to commit your mistake, to commit your future to the Lord. And the result is what? Mm -hmm. Let's bow our heads and pray. If God has been speaking to you, and you have struggles, you have been deceived by Satan, I want you to surrender your mistake to the Lord. Perhaps some of you have never made a commitment, a commitment to really follow God, a commitment to study the Bible. How can you protect yourself if you don't know the truth? So today I ask you to make a commitment to study the Bible and to obey the Bible. 
And if that's your commitment today, remember what you commit, you must do. If you are willing to commit to follow the Bible, will you raise your hands higher? That's you and God. Now, remember, you are going to make a commitment between you and God, okay? And God sees you. If you are not willing to make a commitment to God, don't raise your hands. God knows. But you know something is wrong with you. But if you are willing to humble yourself and say, Lord, today I will surrender my life. I will follow you. Raise your hands. I will pray that God will give you supernatural strength to follow. I will pray that God will grant you mercy and strength so that you will be able to follow him. Anybody else? Today, I want you to surrender your life, to commit even your mistakes to the Lord and trust him completely. Lord Jesus, I now pray for everybody who has raised their hands. You know their struggles. You know their problems. I pray you honor their desire. I pray that you grant all of us the grace and the power to surrender our mistakes, to surrender the bad decisions we have made in the past, to entrust you to correct our future. Lord God, bless your people here today. As your heads are bowed down, I want to ask you also this question. Have you made commitments to God that you have not followed? You tell people you want to do something, but you end up not doing it. You are not a man of honor. You don't keep your word. I want you to repent of that sin also. Starting today, you must learn to honor your commitment, like Joshua. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. If you don't follow your commitment, that is called lying, and that is not good. You need to learn to be careful, be on guard before you make commitments. But once you make commitment, please follow through with your commitment. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you're a man of honor and that you're a God of honor. If you expect us to follow our promises, Lord, I thank you. I can trust you completely to fulfill your promises to each one of us. Just as you have wanted us to fulfill our vows to you, Lord, I thank you for the many promises you have made to us. You promised to forgive our sins. You promised to give us eternal life. You promised to give us a new beginning. And you promised us, Lord, fulfillment, love, joy. So, Lord, I claim your promises for each one of us, that we will experience your promises in your time. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.